I, I just want to briefly mention next week's Grand Rounds presenter, Laurent Enav. This is going to be on Zoom only, uh, and he'll be talking about We Got You Covered, Rebooting American Healthcare. Uh, before I turn this over, Dr. Renault, I just want to say this is, I've said this a few times for many Grand Rounds over the years. This is a, indeed a very special Grand Rounds for, for all of us. And again, it's this, the fact that we have so many people joining online in person says that as well. We have a very, very special presenter that we've been organizing for quite some time now. I will turn over Dr. Renaud, as who also has been instrumental in helping us choose our presenter and just setting everything up. So thank you so much, Sabelle. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Errol. Good morning and welcome to the inaugural Brooke Peterson Gabster Memorial Lecture. I'm Sabelle Renault. I'm one of the infectious diseases faculty, and I lead the global health track for it, our internal medicine residency program. Brooke started her internal medicine residency in our global health track in the summer of 2018. Brooke came to Stanford with a strong background and a clear passion for global health. During her undergraduate years at Princeton, she studied the determinants of under and over nutrition in a region of South Africa. She led the South African food security and nutrition programs and she conducted a food security and nutritional risk assessment of 11 dam sites proposed to be built in the Mekong River in Asia. During medical school, she was co-director of University of Chicago's free clinic based at a homeless shelter. And she was awarded a grant to design and implement an asthma program to improve care for women and children residing there. During the spring of her final year of medical school, she participated in a clinical rotation in Ghana, helping to develop her understanding and solidify her passion for caring for vulnerable patient populations, both domestically and in re low resource settings overseas. Brooke came to Stanford with the ambition to improve health programs and policy to address healthcare disparities. And it was the field of oncology that piqued her interest the most. Eight months into her internship, Brooke received the diagnosis of metastatic osteosarcoma. For two and a half years, she battled her disease fiercely, but she passed away on September 11th, 2021. Brooke's family, her parents, Jim and Leslie Peterson, her sister, Krista, and her husband, Steve, who of course are here today, have partnered with Department of Medicine to establish the Brooke Peterson Gabser Memorial Lectureship with the hope to inspire others to do the work that Brooke was only beginning to do herself. Ultimately, Brooke aspired to advance two causes. The annual lectureship will focus on both of these causes. The lectureship will feature speakers who work to advance global health equity, the cause that was long so important to Brooke, and the lectureship will give voice to individual physicians whose own disabling injury or serious illness has shaped their own perspective and practice of medicine. I now welcome Dean Michelle Berry, Senior Associate Dean for Global Health at Stanford, and she will introduce our inaugural speaker for the Brooke Peterson Gabster Memorial Lectureship. Thank you. Thank you, Sabelle, and welcome Brooke Gapster's family. Um, it's, my more, it's actually my honor to introduce Dr. Rick Hodes, an extraordinary physician who has been living and working in the ground, on the ground, in Ethiopia for 35 years. Rick graduated from Middlebury College and the University of Rochester Medical School. He then went on to train in internal medicine at Hopkins. Rick first went to Ethiopia as a relief worker during the 1984 famine. He returned on a Fulbright Fellowship to teach internal medicine at Addis Ababa University. Over time, he moved beyond internal medicine and deepened his medical knowledge to respond to the urgent needs and unmet needs that he encountered, including rheumatic and congenital heart disease, certain cancers, and spinal conditions. In 1990, he was hired by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, JDC, to care for 25,000 potential immigrants to Israel. In 1991, 
He was part of Operation Solomon, which airlifted over 14,000 Ethiopian Jews to Israel. Currently, Rick serves as the medical director of the JDC Spines program based at Mother Teresa's mission. His mission, however, has been to bring the highest quality medical care to those with the fewest resources, most of them children. Rick doesn't just pr provide much needed treatment to his patients. He attends to each patient as an individual worthy of dignity and the best quality of care. I love that baby. <laughs> and congratulations. <laughs> Currently, he practices at a busy Addis Ababa hospital um, where practically all care is free. And he sees about 500 new deformity probably the most difficult deformity cases in a year. If for some reason his patients, he's a very interesting MO, modus operandi. If, if for some reason his patients are unable to get the type of spine surgery um, in Ethiopia, he simply adopts them and brings them to the US um, to get their care. Um, he's adopted many children. Some of them live in his house. Um, some of them live nearby, um, but it's an unusual way to cover healthcare. Rick's commitment goes far beyond Ethiopia. He's worked with refugees and vulnerable populations all over the world, including Rwanda, Zaire, Tanzania, Somalia, and Albania. He collaborates with colleagues in Ghana, India, Israel, and the US. He is also a senior consultant at Mother Teresa's mission. Rick has been celebrated, and I'm not going to go through all the celebrations. I'll just give you a few of the highlights. Um, he's won the ACP Rosenthal Award for Creative Practice of Medicine. He's been celebrated as a CNN hero. His life story has been the subject of an HBO documentary. And he's had a book written about him by Marilyn Berger. Um, I, love the, I love the title. This is a soul. The mission of Rick Hodes. So anyway, thank you very much, Rick, for joining us today as the inaugural Brooke Gapster speaker. That seems okay. Okay. <clears throat> First thing you do when you get up here is change your glasses. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, at, uh, <laughs> at our age, <laughs> my age. Okay. So, greetings, shalom, anasteling to you all. It's my honor. Really, I'm humbled and a bit scared um, to give this talk in memory of Dr. Brooke Gabster. Dr. Brooke and I never met, but I feel like she would have sent me an email saying, hey, can I spend some time with you? I get those emails all the time. This guy sitting here, how many lived in my house for a year, didn't you? I mean, like you've been to Ethiopia a million times and we just met in an airport. So um, I have a degree in geography. I hitchhiked to Alaska after college, um, did pre-med in Fairbanks, med school in Rochester. Brooke was at Princeton. She studied in South Africa and she worked in Ghana. So I've been in Ethiopia for 35 years. But we fly to Ghana and we do some of the most difficult spine surgeries in the world in Accra, Ghana. There was no global health track back when I was in training, but I managed to spend a summer in Bangladesh, a winter in South India as a student. And I worked in the Ethiopian famine in the 1980s. It was a different world, both culturally and medically. So I knew some American medicine. I'd seen three cases of tuberculosis probably two cases of rheumatic 
heart disease, no cholera, no measles, no epidemic meningitis. Now I've seen hundreds of those, okay? I've treated over a thousand cases of pulmonary TB and a thousand TB spines. I move, moved to Ethiopia right out of residency as a Fulbright lecturer, and I ran the cardiology outpatient department. I used to joke, I'm the closest thing you have to a cardiologist. So let me take you to Ethiopia. Okay, this is what Sarah Palin calls the nation of Africa. Um, okay, can you see that? Okay, you can. Okay, so here we are in Northeast Africa. We are the largest landlocked country in the world. Now, I think this is the clicker. Got it. Okay. So you can see our neighbors, we get along. We have nicer neighbors and less nice neighbors. I'm not gonna comment on who, um, but you can see there's Ethiopia, Addis Ababa is the capital. One third of the land and two thirds of the population live in the Highland Plateau. The nice thing about that is that there is no malaria, okay? I just, I don't wanna give you a lot of statistics, but just some basics, 126 million people. So we are number two in Africa. Uh, Nigeria is over 2 million, uh, 200 million. 2.2 million increase every year. Uh, about 5% die in the first five years of life. Relatively low HIV rate. Um, but listen to this. A woman's chances of dying in childbirth are one in 86, which is something like your rate of chance of you're dying in heart surgery here in California, okay? Um, internet use, 17%, literacy rate, about half, um, basic drinking water, about half, major stunting problem, um, immunization rates are not bad these days, okay? Here we are in Gondar in Northwest Ethiopia in the Highland Plateau. Not a lot of castles in Africa, but we have a very nice one, okay? Who does the carrying in Ethiopia? I guess the question should be, <laughs> who doesn't do the carrying? And the answer is the men, okay? So the women and the donkeys, they carry stuff on their head, they carry stuff on their back, they carry their babies, but this is, uh, this is their life. This is just a street scene in Ethiopia. So I took a job with the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. I taught at the medical school for two and a half years, then I moved over to JDC to be the doctor for the 25,000 Ethiopian Jews who had migrated. So one night I stopped into Black Lion Hospital, which is our huge 800 bed crumbling hospital to visit a nurse friend. She said to me, Rick, well, let me just bring you to Lalibela. This is one of the most amazing things in the world. It's a dozen churches carved out of solid rock 800 years ago. Please come visit us. Okay, now, Bokit. Okay, so my, ner my nurse friend said, Rick, see what you can do to help Bokit. He's as sick as he can be. He had terrible rheumatic heart disease, mostly mitral regurgitation. So I took it as a personal challenge to keep him alive. Every day I drive to the hospital, this is before cell phones, adjust his medicine, trying to diurese him and keep him out of failure. Now, so there you see him. On the left, he looks terrible. And on the right, for the, um, his heart looks terrible. And this, by the way, is not a pericardial effusion, which it also could be. Um, so one day he was in terrible failure. I tried to give him furosemide. It didn't work. I drove down the block, went into a pharmacy, purchased brand name Lasix, came back, injected that, and that worked. So, you know, we had a problem with the quality of medicine. So here he is. Uh, he was discharged to Mother Teresa's mission. And that was my introduction to Mother Teresa's mission, which has changed my life and a lot of lives. Okay. So they define themselves as a home for sick and dying destitutes. I introduced myself to the nuns and I started volunteering. The nuns would call me and tell me, Bogut's in failure. And I'd have to drop what I was doing drive across town and try to treat him. So then I got an idea. I could move him into my house and then I could adjust his meds before and after work and then actually stay in clinic all day long. 
So that's what I did. At night, I'd lie in my bed and I'd see him, I'd hear him coughing through his four pillow orthopnea um, at the other end of the hall. But his heart stabilized. Then he came down with hepatitis B, chronic hepatitis B, elevated liver enzymes. There's some data actually that 13% of Ethiopians are surface antigen positive. Now it's probably better because there's a vaccine, but there wasn't back then, okay? He had elevated liver enzymes, surface antigen positive, huge liver. This is 1995, no treatment, okay? Late in that year, Jules Deanstag of Harvard published a paper in the New England Journal which used lamivudine, which is one of the AIDS drugs, uh, for 12 weeks, okay? Look at this abstract, let's see here. Okay, 100% of those treated with the 100 milligram and 300 milligram dose had undetectable levels of um, hepatitis B. And in six of them, it became sustained. So I got an idea. Maybe if I gave a higher dose or if I gave it for a longer period of time, he would do well. So I got hold of some lamivudine and I started it. He was too weak to walk up the tiny steps to get into my home. Uh, he looked like he'd walked out of a concentration camp. His liver was way below the costal margin. Two weeks later, he had more energy and he was actually doing better. Four months later, he looked somewhat normal. I took photographs. I sent them by mail, no email back then. I sent them to mail by mail to Dr. Deanstag. And I said, listen, um, consider this fan mail because I read your paper. I started this kid on this and look at him now. <laughs> he wrote back and he said, what are you doing? This is not approved in adults and you're using it in a kid. Well, he lived for over 20 years. There he is. Um, and somehow it changed my life. And I continued volunteering at Mother Teresa's mission. He actually graduated from nursing school. Um, and I would show up and ask the nuns how I could help. They have a low level care center. Nobody was doing any oncology. And so I started treating some cancer patients. I wanna show you how I practice, okay? There's this huge amount of bone cancer in Ethiopia. We have no idea why. America has a thousand cases of osteosarcoma for the whole country every year. Half of them are kids and teens. I'm sure we have more. Now, my formal training in oncology is one month on the solid tumor service of Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, let me start with osteosarcoma. A renowned tumor summarized the treatment results. This is at a conference in bone sarcomas in the 1920s. Quote, if you don't operate, they die. If you do operate, they die. Just the same, okay? Five-year survival after a section back then was below 20%. Okay, now, I found a paper from Roswell Park in Rochester in 1981 showing that when you gave cisplatin and doxorubicin at two years, 83% were cancer-free. Okay, this wouldn't hold up over time. It would probably go down to about 50-55%. Um, but it was established that chemotherapy was really important. Let's see, I have an abstract, here it is. The effective adjuvant chemotherapy on relapse-free survival in patients with osteosarcoma. Okay, so at two years, relapse-free survival was 17% in the control group, 66% in the, in the chemotherapy group. So it's really important to give chemotherapy. Those guys that you just saw, this is Muhammad on the left, this is Temeskin on the right. Muhammad has a huge lesion below his left knee. Temeskin had already, his right knee, Temeskin has already lost his left, his right leg, his left leg. Um, they had the same shoe size. So I would bring them into a shoe store. They would get one pair of shoes and they would walk out and the whole store would turn around and look and go, what am I watching? Okay, so I sort of took this as a sign from God that they needed to be together. And they needed to get cisplatin doxorubicin. Okay, the nuns were a bit uncomfortable about me doing that. So I moved them into my house. Oops. What am I doing? 
there they are. Okay, so here we are in my house on a Sunday morning. Um, you can see there's, we're covering the bags to protect it from light with tin foil. Um, I hung the bag, the ivy bags up to my drain pipe with dental floss. Um, and they're getting cisplatin doxorubicin on my front porch. Um, the one on the right is that's my youngest son. And he came out, um, clearly it's a Sunday because he didn't want to wash a dish and we didn't have any clean dishes. But the way to get another dozen dishes in my house, if you, if you take the top of a pot, and you turn it over. And so he's eating his breakfast on the top of a pot. Um, so they actually did okay. Muhammad is still alive. Uh, Temeskin had a recurrence. I managed to send him to Washington, DC. He got Blue Cross health insurance. He got treated at Georgetown and he lived for a few years longer. So this is a kid named Michael. Michael presented to us with a white count of 255,000, okay? That's a spleen. We get big spleens like that in Ethiopia. When the spleen becomes really big, you have a notch on top. Um, I never saw a splenic notch when I was in America, maybe because I never treated hairy cell leukemia, I don't know, but um, we get lots of big spleens with big notches. And so I sent blood abroad to Germany actually, because we wanted to check for Philadelphia chromosome. There's a huge amount of CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia in young people. There was one study in Ethiopia that showed that C CML is the most common leukemia in adults and adulthood in Ethiopia start, medically it starts at 13. That two thirds of CML patients are below the age of 40. Okay, in a 13 month period, there's one study showing the University Hospital in Addis Ababa had 147 new CML patients. This is one hospital in the city. Okay, so some of them come to me. I pay for their testing and we check for Philadelphia chromosomes. So this is how he came to me. Okay, now um, I won't try to <laughs> use the pointer, but okay, look at chromosome 22. You see it's missing the bottom half and then look at chromosome nine. So. That's translocated. This is the Philadelphia chromosome. Uh, we proved that he has CML. And then when we do that, we can get free Gleevec imatinib from Novartis. So I send them over to my hematology colleagues and they can get free, free treatment. There he is on the left two years later. He did fantastic. Um, and this is, this is something that we do all the time. And one of the things I do is try to arrange for this testing so that the patients don't have to pay because it may cost a few hundred dollars, which is prohibitive. On the other hand, $300 to test for Philadelphia chromosome and then a lifetime of free imaginative, this is a pretty good deal. Okay, this is a boy named Ali. Ali's an orphan from Harar. He has this huge tumor that was getting bigger in front of our eyes. Nobody would biopsy it, okay? I could only assume that it was Burkitt's. I went to five pharmacies. I made a list of all the cancer meds they have. It's sort of like, if you wanna buy, bake a cake, you go to the grocery store and you may wanna make a list of everything that they have because they have sparse ingredients and then see what you could put together to bake the cake. So I made a list of all the ingredients. I sent this to a pediatric oncology colleague in Rochester. He wrote back, quote, the main modification I made was to take a single cycle of cyclophosphamide, prednisolone, vincristine, high-dose methotrexate, and doxorubicin, and split it into two cycles. So the high-dose methotrexate and doxorubicin don't have to be given together. I also substituted a few rounds of chemo for the ARA-A and VP-16, which you don't have. The net result is a regimen which A is a little longer, B, it's lighter on the high-dose methotrexate, C, it's heavier on the cyclophosphamide, D, it's about the same on the prednisolone, vincristine, and doxorubicin. If he's wearing out, we can cut those cycles or at least cut out the cyclophosphamide. He did well, okay? I used $1,200 of Indian generic drugs, which I purchased locally. There he is one week later, okay? So a lot of IV hydration. I didn't alkalinize his urine, which is a possibility there to protect the kidneys. Um, chicken pox, very common, no vaccine in Ethiopia for chicken pox. 
Um, every three weeks, I sat him up at Mother Teresa's mission and gave intrathecal chemotherapy, no anesthesia. Um, it takes three minutes, just put it in. He was a trooper. Uh, that's his grandfather who was with him. So, you know, here you might get medical clowns, you might get all sorts of iPads to play with and stuff. At Mother Teresa's mission, you get a clean room and a bed and a bucket to vomit into. And if I'm your doctor, you'll get some on Dancitron as well. There he is when he finished. Okay, so $1,200 of Indian generic drugs. I canceled my vacation and this guy walked home. Okay. Okay, sometimes I can practice remotely. I got an email. I was hiding from COVID in Tennessee, in my cousin's basement. Um, I got an email from my spine patient saying his brother was diagnosed with angiosarcoma. Okay, the doctors told him he needs to leave the country for surgery and radiation. So the first thing I did is I said, send me the PATH report. Reading the PATH report carefully, it was much more nuanced. It actually ended with a differential diagnosis. Number one was angiosarcoma. Number two, caposiform hemangioendothelioma. And they recommended CD31 and CD34 testing, which we can't do in Ethiopia. So I told my patient, drop everything, retrieve the sample, and FedEx it to my pathologist in Rochester, okay? University of Rochester analyzed it and they diagnosed Kaposi's sarcoma, positive for HHV8, okay? So this is a 20 year old boy with, osteo with um, Kaposi's sarcoma. I called my patient, this is just a few days later. And I said, listen, get your brother tested immediately for HIV. He was positive, okay? Now, thanks to George W. Bush, we have the PEPFAR program and we have free AIDS meds, okay? So he was started on HIV meds. He was also started on Taxol. I returned to Ethiopia. Patient had gained 30 pounds. He looked good. I looked in his throat, his nose, everything was receding. Then I said, take your shirt off. He took his shirt off and his chest was filled with the black lesions of Kaposi's sarcoma. So I said to him, did your doctor see this? And he said, no. Nobody took my shirt off. They just looked in my throat. Okay, so there's a lot of lessons here. You don't need to send a pathology block 7,000 miles away for immunocytochemistry. You need to take the patient's shirt off. And a third year medical student can take the patient's shirt off and make that diagnosis. But nobody ever did that. And nobody carefully read the pathology report, which was actually quite well done. Okay. okay. Why is this lady in a burqa? Uh, so I presented to us, this condition that I'm gonna present is not uncommon. And Ethiopian doctors can easily make this diagnosis, but most of us never heard of this, okay? They're usually benign, but they will destroy your life, okay? This was getting bigger and bigger. There she is. Okay, so she walked around during the day, like you see on the, on the left, but underneath, she had the biggest jaw tumor in the world, okay? I heard about a group in Munich that had great skill and I sent them an email. They actually accepted my patient, okay? So I put her in a burqa. I'm the only Jewish doctor putting Christian women into burqas. Um, and we flew to Munich, Germany, okay? I realized she didn't smell very well. And so I went into the duty-free shop, I put, a lot of perfume on her and a lot of perfume on me so that when people walk by on the plane, um, they would smell that. Okay, so here she's getting a CAT scan in Munich, Germany. It created so much information that the machine froze for three hours. Okay, there you can see an X-ray of the tumor. There on the right, you can see this huge septated tumor, which is clearly bigger than her brain. Um, then they did a 17 hour surgery. There you can see the ramus is actually okay. Everything else is not. Um, they did a 17 hour surgery. They removed her fibula. They removed the tumor. They made a new mandible. 
and there she is. Okay, so this is called an ameloblastoma. It's a benign odontogenic tumor coming out of oral epithelium. Here's another example. This lady came to us again like that. That's her tumor. Okay, now she only spoke a rare language called Walaita language. If we sent her to Germany, we'd have to send a translator with her. Well, it turns out Sahai, the first patient, grew up in Walaita. And even though she's not that ethnic group, she spoke the language. So we kept her there and we sent the, nook, the next patient and she translated for her. This is the patient after surgery. Isn't that amazing? We've done over a dozen of these cases. Okay. This patient is miraculous. Okay. The, uh, she'd been my patient for some time. Nobody would touch her. I knew that whatever she had, whether it was benign or malignant, uh, would kill her. Okay, now, see that? You can see, I mean, it, <clears throat> you don't have to be, <laughs> we don't need a neuroradiologist for this. You can see this huge septated tumor. Okay, now it's my personal custom to do morning prayers every day. Well, I woke up in Minneapolis and I overslept and I didn't have time to do morning prayers. So after my first meeting, I said to the guy, take me around, do me a favor, take me to a synagogue. I just wanna do morning prayers. I walked in the synagogue, said hello to the guy next to me. And he said, hi. And I said, what do you do here in Minneapolis? And he said, well, it's very specific. I'm a skull-based neurosurgeon. So I, <laughs> I said, well, let me show you something. And I opened up the computer because this is November in Minneapolis and I didn't want my computer to freeze. So I opened up my computer and right there in the synagogue, I start showing him these scans. And he says, oh my gosh, I'd love to help her. So because of that meeting, six months later, I brought her to Minneapolis. There she is now. I heard from her the other day. She just had a kid, okay? So this is a Muslim orphan raised by Catholic nuns getting free surgery at St. Joseph's Hospital by Dr. Nussbaum and his team. It's the whole world working together. And the diagnosis this is fibrous dysplasia. It's just fibroblasts, okay? But clearly the location is what's gonna, what's gonna kill her, okay? We have plenty of lymphomas. It's probably our number one tumor. One study found that lymphomas are 13 times more common than leukemias in Ethiopia. So this boy showed up at Mother Teresa's mission. His father had sold all of his animals. He ran out of money halfway through the chemotherapy. The nuns asked me to treat him, okay? He had a huge paper file. They're all paper files. Um, I went through them and he had three important documents. He had a biopsy showing that he had Hodgkin's lymphoma. He had another biopsy showing that he had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And he had a biopsy showing that he had a reactive node. I told the dad, I didn't know what to do. I said, listen, take him home. There's nothing to biopsy, I, you, know, you know? So I said, take him home. When there's a change, bring him back. Okay, so here you can, this is when he first presented to us. He has this moon face from his steroids. Um, there he is six months later. You can see he has a big node. Um, we did a biopsy. I sent it to Rochester. The diagnosis, nodular sclerosing Hodgkin's disease. Okay, he had already had plenty of doxorubicin, so I couldn't give him much more. So I wanted to give him radiation therapy. We have one cobalt machine in Ethiopia, which I don't trust. So I said to the nuns, let's see what happens. The next week I got a call. There was a group visiting from Detroit. They wanted me to give them a speech. So I showed up to give this speech. And I said to them, any docs in the room? One guy raised his hand. I said, what's your name? He said, my name is Jeff Foreman. I'm a radiation oncologist. I said, okay, after lunch, Jeff, I'm stealing you. So here we are at Mother Teresa's mission and he's examining Feleke. And he said, how do you know that it's really Hodgkin's? And I said, no, it's University of Rochester. He said, okay, I believe it. So getting good pathology is key. Then he said, get him to Michigan and I'll treat him. I needed a host family. We advertised on Facebook. We found a family in Ann Arbor and I flew him to Michigan. We plugged him in for radiation therapy. 
Here he is getting a dry run on the first day for radiation. That's the Oromo translator of Minneapolis. Um, you can see his scan over there. He had some months of radiation therapy. Okay. This young man has testicular cancer. Now the problem with testicular cancer in Ethiopia, we don't have any salvage therapy. So I wanted to get it right the first time. I sent an email to Dr. Larry Einhorn, the guru in Indiana, explaining the situation. And I said, listen, this is our only shot. Should I do anything different? And he said, yeah, use three cycles of bleomycin, etoposide, and cisplatin, and then give him an extra cycle without the cisplatin. I needed money. Girls in New York City had a bake sale. They sent me the money. I brought the chemotherapy. He did fine. And here he is dictating a thank you letter to my son who translated it into English. And we sent it on to these girls. Okay. Here's my son a year later. This is what happens to your kids when they become teens, even in Ethiopia. Okay. Um, a rabbi once told me the reason that God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac at the age of 12 and not 13 is that at 13, it's no longer a sacrifice. <laughs> okay, this is recent. This guy walked in very recently and he asked for help. This smiling guy is an Ethiopian Orthodox priest from Gojong. I did imaging. This is astounding, isn't it? Okay, now look at this. This is the, uh, the, the plain film. And then I did this amazing CAT scan, okay? We, this is a 3D uh, reconstruction. These are called popcorn calcifications. This is a chondrosarcoma, okay? There he is, there it is. So it's chondrosarcoma of the scapula, low grade. So right now I put up a website, we're raising money to send him to India. And I'm, I wanna start him on niclosamide, which is one of the <clears throat> parasitic drugs off label because it actually has activity against this. Okay, this kid came to us at Mother Teresa's mission with a droopy eye. Okay, he had severe headaches. I got imaging. Okay, it's always a problem when you get a CAT scan back and it shows a bullseye, okay? Nobody would do the biopsy. Um, I made some calls. I found there was one visiting ENT doc from Minnesota. I woke her up at 11 o'clock at night. She told me she's leaving the next day. Show up eight o'clock in the morning, NPO. So we got him to the hospital the next morning, NPO. She did the biopsy. We got it to America. Turns out this is an embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma of the orbit. That's really bad. Um, we started him on chemotherapy. Halfway through, he needed radiation. So I picked up the phone. I called the good Dr. Jeff Foreman again. And he said, bring him over. Okay. So here he is getting his chemotherapy. There he is uh, flying to America. He got his radiation therapy, came back, finished his chemotherapy. He called me one night and he said, Rick, I'm homeless. My aunt just kicked me out of the house because she wants to get married. So I said, you want to move in with us? And he said, sure. So the next day he moved into my house and for two years he commuted to high school from there. Everything changed in my life in 1999. Okay, I was working at Mother Teresa's mission, doing all this other stuff. And then we got an admission of these two guys. Okay, so these are abandoned orphans with tuberculosis of the spine. Their kids are still growing. They had multivertebral TB. If they didn't get treated, they'd have a good chance of becoming paralyzed and dying. Okay, the one on the right is an Oromo from Becho. One on the left is a Gojami. They're different ethnic groups. They actually spoke different languages until they both learned Amharic. Um, nobody would touch them. Nobody would do surgery. And then I got this, even doctors said, don't touch them, this is far too dangerous. Then I got this brilliant idea. I could adopt them, add them to my health insurance and bring them to America for surgery. Now, the problem is when you adopt an abandoned orphan who doesn't have any relatives, they become yours for life. So on one hand, I could save their life. On the other hand, we'd have to spend the rest of our lives together. 
I really didn't need that much permanence. Well, one day I was walking along and I looked up at the Almighty and I said, what do you want me to do? Well, I listened for a minute. There was no answer. This probably happened to you once or twice. <laughs> a few days later, he actually sent a fax to my brain with an instant message, clearly. And it said, quote, I'm offering you a chance to help these boys. Don't say no. Okay, so I adopted them. I added them to my health insurance, found a great host family, and we went down to Dallas, Texas for surgery. I make it seem easy, like three sentences. Nothing is easy in Ethiopia. Okay, another patient came along. Oh, there they are. Here they are after their surgery. <clears throat> okay, this is a real picture. You want to try this with one of your friends? The person in my position has to weigh about 15 pounds more than the other person. Okay, another patient came along. I did the same thing. Okay, but serial adoption is probably not the answer to spine deformity in Africa. So I needed to come up with a better solution. The better solution has a wonderful name, Ohenebobuachi Aje. He was the chief of the spine surgeon, surgery, service at Hospital for Special Surgery. And to put it in the words of Kurt Vonnegut, we're part of the same caress, okay? Which is, quote, a network or group of people that unknown to them are linked specifically to fulfill the will of God, okay? I did fundraising. In the spring of 2006, we started our JDC spine program with the blessing of the Ministry of Health. I sent five Ethiopian patients to Korlebu Hospital in Accra. Dr. Burke also worked at Korlebu. Uh, Dr. Boachi flew in with his American team. They operated on our kids. It was a real learning curve for us. We learned that at night in Korlebu Hospital, the night nurses would sit in a chair, put their legs up, put a blanket over their head, and go to sleep. So they were sleeping babysitters. So we had to provide the nursing care. Um, now, let me show you what we've done in the field of spine, okay? This is a guy named Sintayo. Sintayo is one of the worst spines in the world. This is a congenital scoliosis. We sent him to our partners in Ghana. Let's see what else we have here. Oh, okay. Everybody, stand up. Everybody, stand up. Okay, take your hand and put it on your patella. Now look around and look at the angle that you see each other at, okay? Sit down. <laughs> okay, this is something that I discovered and that I've turned into a thing. When your hands touch your patella, you've lost 50% of your force vital capacity because your spine is so twisted that it's compressing your lungs. So it's actually a proxy indicator of your lung function. And every patient gets a picture of their hands and their knees. Okay, that's his spine. Is that incredible? Like this is out of this world. Okay, so. Um, we like the FVC to be at least 30% predicted, and it's predicted by arm span, by the way, so patients don't become ventilator dependent. Sintayo, this guy, started out with an FVC of 0.68 liters. That's 16% predicted. That's two cans of Coca-Cola. So he's living 8,000 feet above sea level, and his forced vital capacity is two cans of Coca-Cola, okay? After surgery, it actually improved to above one liter. Now, so how do we do this? We send the patients to Accra, Ghana. Now, this is a world's record picture because we're the only group in the world doing this in mass. This is called halo gravity traction. These kids are sitting there. You see there's a spring system up on top. There's a pressure gauge. You start with five pounds of pressure. You go up to half their body weight. Leave it at half their body weight for months. Um, what do we do all day long as human beings? There's three things. We sit, we stand, we lie down. So they're being, they're sitting, but they're getting stretched. When they're walking in the morning and in the evening, because Ghana is quite hot in the middle of the day, they're being stretched that way. Okay. Um, so he went into traction for months. 
here he is. So he started out with an AP, whoops. He started out with an AP angle of 170, 170 AP and 174 laterally. Four months later, he was down to 127 by 132. Whoops. This has a mind of its own. Okay, then it, he had surgery. Let's see. Okay. Um, any idea? This has a mind of its own because I'm not touching it. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so here he is in traction. Okay, you can see the bottom left picture. So he's actually in traction during surgery. He got five rods. Um, he ends up with 108 degrees, which, you know, this is 108 degrees would be a terrible curve in America to start with, and he ends up with 108 degrees by 75 degrees. There he is, there he is. So you can see us before, you can see us afterwards. I've shrunk tremendously. <laughs> and his lungs are inflated. He's now an engineer, so he did great. Okay, you guys don't see this, so I put this in. Okay. Um, in America, bumper stickers declare, we break for animals, okay? If I have one, a bumper sticker in Ethiopia, it would say, I pull over for spine patients. Um, my assistant and I were driving along and we saw this guy slowly walking with elbow crutches. Clearly, this is the gait of somebody with polio. There's lots of people in Ethiopia who have the gait of somebody with polio. Back in the 1950s, listen to this. 600,000 people a year were paralyzed annually um, before the polio vaccine. And he had a notable scoliosis. You can see he has, you know, sort of a three in his, for his control. Whoops. Okay, Doc, what do you think? <laughs> okay, so here he is. Um, you can see he doesn't have a lot of control over his legs. There he is before, and see how withered his legs are? Now, one, I talked about how important it is to undress your patients. Every year, we have at least one patient who comes in with a normal gait and when I take off their pants to take this picture of their legs, I see that one leg is withered compared to the other. And then I ask, is one leg weaker than the other? They'll say, yeah. And then we'll put it together and it's actually a polio case. So I get at least one new polio case a year. Un, un, sometimes they walk and you can tell, but unexpected. Now look at how flexible this guy is. You see on the right, how kyphotic he is. And on the left, you see how much, how he stretches. All he needs is two months of traction to straighten him out. So there you see his lungs before. And on the right, this is the pulmonary view of the, of the CAT scan. There's the 3D reconstructions of his spine. Okay, his FVC started out at 16% predicted again, it was 0.58 liters. I gave him two breathing devices. One is a three bulb spirometer. The other is just some sort of resistance device that I get from Amazon. Um, send him to Ghana. Here he is in traction. 
He ended up with instrumentation from T1 through the pelvis. There he is now. Um, and he's about to fly, just saw him the other day. I took these pictures just two, three weeks ago. And he's about to fly home. Um, okay, since we're talking about tumors, I want to present Hussein. This guy came to us and he said, I have pain in my back. So right in the, uh, the mid back on the right, there's a little swelling. And that was it. I did an x-ray. I don't see anything wrong with this x-ray. Dr. Boachi did. And he said, do some more imaging. So I got an MRI. Now look at this. You see this infiltrative lesion? The question here is, is this malignant or not? Because if this is an osteosarcoma or a Ewing's, that would be it. Okay. Uh, so I needed a biopsy. Boachi was visiting. And we went in, we did the biopsy. Um, there you can see where the lesion was. During the, bi the biopsy, he turned to me, he said, Rick, this is really vascular. If this guy needs surgery, he's gonna need embolization. Um, it's a big deal. Like don't operate without embolization. So sent the biopsy to Rochester. Turns out this is what they call an ABC, an aneurysmal bone cyst. Um, these are very vascular, but they can do okay. So. He needed to get surgery, but he also needed embolization. You can do that here. It'd probably be a half a million dollar case. I sent him to India, okay? I sent him to a Hindu hospital in India. He had really good surgery. They removed what, what they call D5, dorsal five. This is T5 in our language. Um, you can see they put in a cage in its place. Um, and he did, he did fantastic. Okay. Uh, this girl came to us. This is a very unusual curve, even for those of us who see curves, like that sort of pointed nose thing. This is something, this is not TB. This is something worse. Okay, so when we did her x-rays, the angle, her actual spinal angle computes to 246 degrees. Okay, so it's terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, and that's on the right, the 3D reconstruction. Okay, we put her into traction. She gained seven inches in traction. They removed um, several bones. They instrumented her. When you see the cage, uh, it's a sign that you've had vertebra removed. She did fantastic, okay? No neurologic, sometimes we have neurologic sequelae, she had none. And uh, since we're talking about Ethiopia, I need to talk about TB of the spine. This is a guy named Dagim. And by the way, all these people have given us permission to show their pictures. Um, so he's bent over like this, this perfect kyphosis, this is typical of TB. And these, I see a new one of these every week. Like every week I'll get, I'll get one. And you know, even if while they're taking their shirt off, my assistant, who's a, He'll say, it's TB. So there you can see um, the destruction and he did fine. We did school screening. Um, now I wanna give you some follow-up. Remember Faleke, the guy who went off to Michigan um, for radiation therapy? He was adopted by his host family. He ended up, uh, he's going to college now studying computers. There he is now. Um, remember Befakadu, the one with the rhabdomyosarcoma of the orbit? Uh, he ended up going to Rochester for cancer camp and ended up um, going to high school there, went to the University of Rochester, for full scholarship, graduated. He now designed it with a degree in biomedical engineering. He now designs designer molecules in Boston. Remember Jamila? with the 246 degree curve. There she is now, okay? So um, I now have the largest collection of the worst spines in the world. And our goal is to build a spine center and build capacity in Ethiopia. If you have any ideas on how I can do this, talk to me, okay? A lot of people tell you, follow your passion, okay? I have to tell you, I'm the least likely doctor to become a spine patient. This was not my passion. I never did a neurosurgery rotation. I never did um, an orthopedic rotation. Victor Frankel was the 
Holocaust survivor who wrote Man's Search for Meeting. He said, it didn't really matter what we expected from life, but rather what life expected from us. He had an assignment, okay? Well, I, I'm no Viktor Frankl, but I have an assignment, and now I'm dealing with these people all day long. Okay, Albert Schweitzer observed, um, anyone who proposes to do good must not expect people to roll any stones out of the way, he must calmly accept his lot, even if they roll a few more into it. Only force that can overhaul, overhaul, that in the face of obstacles can become stronger, can win. So the stones pile in. My initial goal was to help three kids with bad backs, not to learn anything about spine deformity. And now that's all I do, okay? What message would Dr. Brooke give to you? Okay, you're some of the best physicians in the world. You're getting some of the best training in the world. Uh, when I arrived in Ethiopia in the 1980s, the university hospital got three MIs a year. Now they get MIs every day. There's lots of diabetes. You have skills that can help. Consider coming over or doing something to join us. Okay. Um, to Meskin, the guy I sent to Rochester, I'm sorry, the guy I sent to Georgetown for chemotherapy when he had recurrence, he ended up dying, but his host family was so taken by this, they started a foundation to treat and to educate doctors um, about cancer in Ethiopia. And now I don't have to treat it anymore. I just send them to their, send my new cancer patients to their program. Okay, now. Dr. Brooke was an exceptional woman exceptional doctor with a drive to improve the care of people all around the world. She did not live to see this happen. Life's not fair and life can make little sense to all of us. For all of us who are privileged and challenged to deal with human suffering every day, I can only say that I have more questions than answers. Peter Mathiasen wrote in The Snow Leopard, quote, the absurdity of a life that may well end before one understands it does not relieve one of the duty to that self, which is inseparable from others, to live it through as bravely and generously as possible. Dr. Brooke, we're thinking about you and we will go forward. Thank you. It's incredibly inspiring. Um, we usually take Q and A afterwards. Um, I, I, if people in the audience have questions, but I, there is one question um, in the Zoom, which is how can we help? Uh, contact me through my website, rickhodes.org, and uh, we can correspond. You must have a, quite a website. <laughs> <laughs> Are there questions in the audience? For Dr. Hodes. I think you've just all struck everybody. If not, thank, thank you very much. I do want to, if, if you want to get to know a little bit about the man behind this lecture, um, on Thursday evening between five and six, and we'll have some food, um, he will have a personal conversation with Paul Costello about not only his work, but the man behind his work, which I think you, you really showed us truly in, the, in this presentation. So thank you. And thank you, the Brooke family. Thank you. Also want to mention, we have a reception right after this, just upstairs, room 205, 206. So please do join us for refreshments and hang out with Dr. Hode some more and chat with them. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I don't think it could get better as the first. What's that? Yeah. I don't think it could get better. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? Wow. 
The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.